So what I'd like to do today is to continue talking about STL. We're going to talk about the fourth major capability today, or start talking about it. We'll probably get through most of it. As you recall, we've talked about containers, associative containers, sequential containers, and so on. We've talked about the uh, iterators, the different categories of iterators, random access iterators, bidirectional iterators, and so on. We've talked about some of the algorithms. There's lots more than we talked about, but they're good ones to know. And then uh, now we're going to talk about the next topic, which is function objects, more commonly known as, as functors. So a functor in STL is basically an instance of a struct or class that overrides, or not overrides, overloads operator function call. Of all the strange things, they over, let you overload that. There's a couple of helper functions, unary function and binary function, that are used for various purposes to make it easier to define your own functors. And STL also, in addition to making it easier to define your own functors, there's also lots and lots of functors that you get out of the box from STL. Uh, some of them have to do with arithmetic operations, like plus and minus and divides and so on, multiplies. Others have to do, <coughs> others have to do with comparison, equal to, less than, uh, greater than, and so on, or greater. And uh, these are all things that you'll use pretty commonly. There's, by default, most of the comparison is done using the less functor. And uh, a lot of the, the containers use less as the default comparator. The sort algorithm uses less as the default comparator. But it's easy to override that if you so choose. There's also logical operators, like logical and, logical or. Those are not very commonly used, but they're there. And um, many of the STL algorithms use these functors. And also, other things in STL use these functors, too. We'll, we'll talk later about, about function adapters. And you'll see that the, the binders that we talked a little bit about last time, and we'll cover further this time, go into more detail about that. Yes, sir? How does this differ from, or I guess relate to, in like when we do like the equality operator in our method? Uh -huh. um, is that kind of similar? So the equality operator is basically a C++ operator that ends up being you know, written in your code, and you define it. And if you use it in a context where equal equal is required, it'll use the one you define. Functors are generalizations of those kinds of things. And so it allows you to write generic algorithms that can be uh, parameterized by a functor, which gives you the ability to do things that's more generalizable than just having operator equal equal defined. And so the main thing is you, you you use them for slightly different purposes, but they, in some cases, play the same role. If you recall the discussion we had about the predicate functions, like uh, remove if, or copy if, or all those kinds of things, those take a predicate. So remove just uses uh, operator equal equal. But the predicate version, the if, remove if, that lets you pass in a functor. And you can determine how you're going to define what it means to do the, the comparison that the functor uses. Or the func you write, provide the functor that the, the algorithm uses to do the comparison. Kristen? I was going to ask what the difference between function and predicate. OK. I think when you, see how it's <clears throat> when you start seeing examples of it, it becomes very clear. Because there's lots of situations where you need to be able to pass these things in as template parameters. And uh, operator equal equal doesn't work quite the same way that functors do. Because you, don't, you can't call it using function call syntax. Whereas that's one of the beautiful things about functors. They work anywhere where you can call a function, because they have the function call syntax. Whereas operator uh, equal equal is not used in that way. It has a different way of using it being used. But you'll see, I think when we get into the examples, you'll see. If there's still questions, of course, don't hesitate to ask. All right, let's take a look at some examples. Here's a very simple example. So as you're probably uh, aware, STL provides a sort mechanism. Surprise, surprise, that's one of the most Fundamental forms of algorithms is sorting and searching, so it's no surprise that STL would provide that. Here's a simple program where we read all the arguments in from the command line, push them to the end of the vector. And of course, they're just whatever order they're in. We don't know if they're sorted or not at that point. They're just whatever order you put them in. Remember, sequential containers, when you do a pushback, the order they show up in is the order you push them back in. They don't order them any other way. What would happen if we replaced vector with, say, set? What would be the, the, the difference there? As you insert them, it would sort them using the red-black tree, balance tree we talked about. So this is not necessarily sorted. We don't know. So then we go ahead and call the sort algorithm. And we say sort from beginning of the range to the end of the range. And by default, if we don't do anything differently, it'll sort in ascending order. But if we do this, it'll sort in descending order. So let's go ahead and 
copy and paste this code. I'll make my window bigger so you can see it in the back. Let's see. And let's go ahead and kind of clean this up a little bit so it's somewhat easier to read, although we're not really going to look at it in any detail. Let's first go ahead and, and do the version here that's uh, going to sort in ascending order. Make it so you can read it. G++, Z.CPP. It worked. And let's go and say uh, A that out. Hello there, world. Oops. Oh, I guess it would actually help if we if we printed out the result. Otherwise, it's not going to uh, to be very useful, is it? Let's try to do. Uh, we'll do something simple. STD vector. Standard string. Iterator. I. Better make sure we include IO stream here. Set equal to projects dot begin i not equal to projects.end plus plus i. Make, make sure you get in the habit of using plus plus i. And then we say uh, standard c out um, i equal, just print it out, star i and standard end all. All right, hopefully that'll still compile. Yes, it does. All right, so it says hello there world, which doesn't really help as much because it's the same order we gave there. Um, how are you today? We'll be very polite. So this says, our hello, how there you today you. It sounds maybe like what Yoda might say. <laughs> but let's say we don't want to have it in, in ascending order. We want to have it in descending order. Well, that's just absolutely trivial to do in STL. We just replace the use of the default version, the default parameter, which is less, with greater. And we go ahead and recompile. And we run. And lo and behold, it prints it in reverse order. So it's in descending order. So you can see, just by changing the functor that's passed in, it changes the way in which the behavior of sort and its comparison works. Now, just for sake of argument, um, you know, sort of scratch your head. How would you do that by using operator equality? And the answer is you could. So uh, it would take surgery to the code and lots of changes. And the great thing here is you just plug in a different functor, and away you go. And of course, the way that's used under the hood is inside of sort, they take the third parameter, and they use it as a, as a predicate, essentially, or a comparison operator. And it'll return you know, true or false if, if the left hand is less than the right hand, or it, how it compares to the other, th to the other side. So for every time there's a comparison, it uses that uh, functor that's passed in to do that. So that, that is a more generalizable way of doing things than trying to use operator equality. Danny? You mentioned how uh, sorting and set algorithms uh, are somewhat different than normal descending algorithms. Are they still technically considered to be descending algorithms? Yes. They just kind of factor them out in the STL documentation, but uh, they're, they're, muta they're really mutating algorithms. It's just that sorting and Sorting and searching are such a fundamental part of computer algorithm folklore that they had to give them special privileges. It's kind of like having a permanent seat on the United Nations. You know, you get treated specially because you were there first. Right? So sorting and, and uh, searching are very fundamental things. OK, any questions about that? So again, just, just for those of you who asked the very good questions about you know, how do functors differ from op operator equality, it's worth sort of scratching your head and, and trying to figure out how you would do this with operator quality. And the answer is it would be a real pain in the butt. Um, so we wouldn't even want to. OK. So let's come back here, go back to our slides. So that's, that's basically function objects. Now again, there's a lot of them built in. The ones that you're most likely to ever use are ones like uh, less and greater, by far the most common ones to use. Less is the most common one. The other ones come in handy under various circumstances, but be aware that there's lots of them that are defined for you. OK, next topic, adapters. So we talked before, yes, Patrick. Uh, what, what, in a working, what kind of, how does it sort it, like bubble tools or 
Oh, great question. How does sort work? So uh, as it turns out, STL sort uses something called intro sort or introspective sort. And basically, introspective sort is an adaptive sort routine that uses quick sort, except if it discovers that things aren't sorting well. Quick sort is one of these interesting sorts that works very well, usually, but occasionally goes awry. And so if it detects things are going awry, then it switches over and it uses heap sort instead. So it's an adaptive sort. So it introspects on how the sorting behavior is going. Um, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different ways to do sorting. Quick sort is generally perceived as being the, the best sort most of the time, but it can be pathological in a few cases. There's a whole science of sorting that goes on and on. Generally, the comparison and exchange sorts, of which bubble sort is the most well-known example, are, um, are the sorts that are least efficient. They're typically O of n squared time complexity. And then the ones that are more sophisticated are typically n log n. Sorting sorts are often <coughs> named after their, uh, their inventors. For example, shell sort is named after Donald Shell. Bubble sort named after Mr. Bubble, of course. <laughs> I've been waiting to work that one in. And thank you. I, actually, I, I paid Patrick to uh, ask that question so we could, we could work it in there. So um, the adapter design pattern, I told you the example before of my grad student who uh, played his CD through the 8-track um, to the cassette player. So the basic purpose of the adapter pattern, which we will cover later, is to adapt something that exists and it expects one interface to a different interface expected by something else without having to change what's already done. You take what you got and you adapt it. It's very it's sort of a fundamental human thing to adapt things and make them work. There are different kinds of adapters. There are three types of adapters. There's container adapters, iterator adapters, and function adapters. I told you last time you weren't responsible for knowing those types of adapters. After this slide and the next few slides, now you're going to be responsible for knowing them. So container adapters are used, and I'll talk more about this. Container adapters are used to take existing containers like vectors and decks and give them interfaces that are more restrictive, like stacks and queues, while still using the vector or deck or, or list or whatever implementation to do the actual implementation of the stack. So those are container adapters. Iterator adapters, you've seen one already, back inserter. We'll see some other ones, reverse iterator and so on. These are used to take things that are not iterators, like containers, and make them work in contexts where iterators are expected. So the classic example here would be the back inserter, which you can use to add things to the end of a container when you don't know how big the input is. You don't know necessarily ahead of time how big the input sequence is. So you can use an output adapter. You can use an iterator adapter along with an output iterator in order to be able to make a container grow, grow, grow as you add things to it. Function adapters, negators and, and binders, we'll talk more about those things. Those are really cool. They take a little getting used to when you're first exposed to them, but they're very powerful. And, and allow you to do an amazing amount of expressive code with an economy of, of typing. They're often used to narrow things. The, like in the case of the container adapters, you, you use the adapter to narrow the, the vector interface to something expected for a stack. So let's talk about some of these things. <clears throat> there are three types of container adapters in classic STL, stacks, queues, and priority queues. So we'll go through and talk about each of them and give you a little discussion about them. So the stack, hopefully you know what a stack is from 201 or maybe even 101. It's a LIFO, last in, first out data structure. And uh, basically has you insert elements at the top and remove them from the top. A queue is a FIFO data structure. You put things at the end. And the uh, next item, the, the item that, oh, sorry, you, you put things at the end of the queue. And then someone takes them off the head of the queue. So it's first in and first out. What's interesting, anybody here ever, ever uh, fly overseas? One of the things that sticks in my mind, most, most Americans are usually, most people in the US are pretty good about queuing, right? If you, if you have to wait, people sort of stand in line. Not every culture is a queuing culture. Uh, the British are into queuing. We probably picked up queuing from the British. The French do not queue, they bunch. Right? So it's really interesting. You, you travel to other countries, it's just a big, it's like a rugby scrum or something like that when you're waiting to get on an airplane. Kind of funny. Priority queues, that's another kind of a queue. It's a variant of a queue where you insert items into the queue and they, go at the, they start out by going into the end, 
But when they come out, they come out according to their priority. And so the, the item that's served first, the item that's removed next, when you get the next item from a priority queue, is always the item of highest priority. So the, the best example I can think of for a priority queue would be something like uh, if you were a, a bartender at, a, at an officer's club for the armed services, you would probably have to serve your clients in rank order. So if, if a, a lowly uh, captain shows up, you know, think of, think of Top Gun or one of those movies. Lowly captain shows up, and a, a major or a general or a colonel or whatever is ahead of the captain, then the captain just going to have to wait their turn because we do it by rank. There's lots of examples of, of queuing things by priority as well. It's determined by having the item that you are acting on have a less than operator defined. So it, it sorts them in, by default, it sorts them in ascending order. But uh, you can control that. You can, you can pass in a different kind of functor if you choose. And of course, you can also define what less than does. So you, or conceivably, you could define what less than does. If you don't like what less than does, you can either make your own comparison operator, or you can make an adapter that takes whatever you're using and adapt its less than to behave in a different way. Great question. So the question is, how is, how, is, uh, how is priority managed in a priority queue? It's, it's managed internally by something called a heap. And a heap is an interesting data structure. It's a partially ordered, almost complete binary tree. Let's take a quick look. <clears throat> if you haven't been exposed to heaps, they're really uh, quite fascinating. One of the more interesting data structures you're likely to run across. Let's see if I have a browser open anywhere. There we go. Oops, that's not a browser. That's, that's my stuff where I, I make clip art for my, my videos. It's kind of like a morgue. You just reassemble things. There we go. That looks more like it. OK, so let's go over here and let's say heap data structure. And it should come up, of course, with Wikipedia. Everything worth knowing is somewhere on Wikipedia, probably. And here is a heap. This is a binary heap. It's a max heap. The, highest, the item of highest priority is in the root of the tree. And uh, as you can see, it's, a, it's an almost complete. What that means is if there's any items that are not there, they're only not there on the last level. And it's partially ordered. And if you look at the ordering, it's not totally ordered. It's just partially ordered. The item in the parent is always higher than the items who are its children. So as you can see, it's ordered like that. And the way that that works for doing uh, priority queues in STL is there's some STL algorithms, of course, called heap heapify algorithms. And they take a vector. They take a vector of arbitrary contents. And in linear time, they can convert the, the vector into a heap. And once something is converted into a heap, which takes linear time, then all operations on the vector, like insert, remove, or insert, erase, and find all take log n time. And what you end up doing is you remove the item of highest priority, that which is always at the root. And then you take the item that's at the end, and you swap it with the, uh, into the root. And then you bubble it down the heap. And so it ends up resting in the right place by comparing with the left and the right children. So it takes no more, you know, you can obviously tell it takes no more than log n steps to find out where an item goes, because the tree is never more than log n levels deep. So that's how the heap works. Patrick? So the priority queue, when you kind of gave it random letters, it would spit them back out alphabetically? Uh, well, it would, it, the order in which you gave them, whatever they happened to be in the queue at that point. Uh, so if you, if you took random letters and you threw them into the queue, and you ordered them that way, and then you started removing them, they would be, they would be sorted. Yeah. And, and it would take, uh, for all you algorithms people out there, how long would it take to do that? in terms of asymptotic time complexity. If you, had n, if you had n letters that you wanted to put into a priority queue, how long would it take to put them in and take them out asymptotically? And log n, exactly. So you have n of them, and each operation takes no more than log n time, so that's n log n. It's like one of those real easy, you, you want your algorithms class to have that as the final exam, right? That's, that's an easy one. Was there another question? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, great question. So is, is, the, is the heap that we talk about when we talk about dynamic memory allocation the same concept as the concept of, of a binary, almost complete, partially ordered binary tree or, or tree? Not really. I think when people think about, I mean, conceivably, you could do some kind of heap data structure to implement the, the heap <laughs> free store. But I think when you think about the heap free store, it's just like a heap of memory. It's sort of like a big pile of memory. And you come in and you know, think, about, um, think about the office of some professor who hasn't cleaned it up in 40 years, right? I, I had a, a theory professor when I was a grad student whose desks, was, his desks and cabinets were just piled full of papers. And I said, how do, you ever, how do you ever find anything in here? And he said, it's O of 1 insertion and O of N find, right? <laughs> Because whenever that something came in, it just went, you know, just randomly put it somewhere, and then it took forever to find it. So, uh, I, I think heap in that context just means a pile of memory. But that's a really good question. Okay. Oh, another along those lines, uh, if you really want to have some fun, like as a parlor game or something like that, um, try to think through all the different ways in which the keyword static is used in C and C++. I think there's about five different ways it's used in C, maybe six or more different ways it's used in C++. Interesting use of the same term to mean somewhat different things. OK, so let's take a look at some examples. So here's an example where we have a stack, which is parameterized, as you can see, by the type name T, of course. And then it's also given a default, a default implementation, which is a deck of T. So if you don't do anything to the contrary, your stack will be implemented as a deck. Not actually quite sure why they did that. I probably would have used a vector, but they used a, a deck maybe because it's a little bit more memory conserving than a vector, which has to be contiguously allocated. So as you can see, you don't actually expose out any of the deck methods. You, you don't get deck methods exposed. You just get stack methods exposed, right? Like top and push and pop. And notice that they distinguish between popping and topping for the exception handling reasons we talked about before. You don't want to have pop, both take something out of the stack as well as return it, because you can have exception issues. Question? Explicit says, uh, do not perform standard conversions when you're passing parameters to this object through its constructor. So explicit says, it's got to be exactly what you're saying here. So C++, one of the somewhat quirky things that C++ has, and I I think in retrospect, if they had a chance to do it all over again, they might not have done implicit conversions. Because there's situations where you can use stuff and it implicitly converts from one thing to another. As, as a simple example, you might have a string class. And you might have an ex implicit conversion that takes an instance of string and returns it as a number, if it is a number. So you could say int i equals s, where s is a string. And there'd be an implicit conversion from string to int. But that makes your code somewhat complicated to understand. So there's situations where you don't want those things to take place. And by using the explicit keyword, it says, don't do implicit conversions. Make someone explicitly ask for something. Interesting. <coughs> Declared, are you thinking, not thinking about extern? You might be thinking about extern. Uh, in order to implement uh, an implicit conversion, is there like a Usually, it's just uh, you would just have an operator that returned that kind of thing. Would that be like typecasting? Yeah, very much like that. Yes. Uh, so implicit conversions don't require casts. If you do it with typecast, that's an explicit conversion. Danny. No, it would not compile. Uh, explicit is a compile time thing. It, it doesn't let your code compile if there's a problem. Which is really what you want. You, you, you have to cast any or, or you have to make sure you don't use things that require a conversion. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, so that's what the interface looks like. Here's a queue. Queue's interface is a little quirky, let's be honest. If I think about a stack, I think of operations like push and pop. That makes sense to me. If you take a look at the queue interface, I don't know what happened. They must have thought that um, there was like some kind of two for one discount if they used the same names. So they called operations to put things at the end of a queue and remove things from the front of the queue, push and pop also, which just makes no sense. I, I think of a queue as having operations like get and put, or nq and dq, or something like that, but not 
push and pop. Makes no sense whatsoever, but that's what we've got. Those, those things have the same names. And as you can see, it's the same basic idea. They use a deck as the implementation of the, the queue, and they have uh, explicit and all this other good stuff. Here are some very simple examples that show how this works. I'm not going to spend much time on them. You, you probably could figure this out, no problem. Here's a stack. We put a bunch of items in the stack. While the stack isn't empty, we take each item and, and print it, and then pop it off the stack. Similar kind of thing with the queue. We put a bunch of things on a queue. While the queue's not empty, we go ahead and remove things from the queue. Yes? So are these designed in a way so that the end user has no idea of telling them it's a container adapter they think it's a full container? Good question. The question is, uh, does the end user know it's actually not its own special implementation cooked up, um, particularly for this particular uh, use case? The user doesn't know. They just, they, you know. In fact, you could change it if you wanted to. If you, if you felt compelled to write your own specialized version of a stack, you could certainly do that. But there was no need to do it. It really didn't, didn't buy you much in that case. You'll see adapters are often used to make there be less work while giving some slight enhanced functionality. Question? Value type. Value type. Oh, um, yeah, good question. So there's a couple of different options when you define a template class. All these things, of course, are containers, so they all work on type T as the, the type for the container. So you have two options as somebody who's, who's trying to write the implementation. You can either use T. So here where we see like top, top returns a T, could return a T. You could have uh, back return a T and so on. Uh, or you could have push take a T. Or a more STL-ish trait-like way of doing things is to use the fact that all containers have a type def called a trait that says type def T, which is the type parameter, value type. And that really comes in handy other places where you no longer know what the parameter is anymore. But in the implementation of the class, you have a choice. You either use T or value type. So they're just being more self-consistent with STL's idiom of naming, even though it's not strictly necessary in this case. What you would do if you needed to, if you had some arbitrary uh, container C and you needed to get access to whatever its type T was, then you could say C, you know, type name C colon colon value type, and that will always be the type that's the contents of that container. And you can type name the C, C colon colon value type to whatever that, type name you Here, just, just to be very, very specific, let me show this to you because it's too mysterious to say it. All right, so here, let's, here's a good example. So uh, I could say uh, standard, well, here, how about if we do this? You know, template type name C. Um, void print. And we'll say, uh, you know, const C container. And uh, I wouldn't exactly write code like this, but this is certainly possible to write this code. I could say uh, type name C iterator I equal container dot begin I not equal to container dot end. That's all just good old same old, same old. And then down here, I could say uh, type name C value type T equal star I, right? And then I could do something with this. I mean, I could say standard C out T or something like that. Uh, so you'll notice that the, the code I just wrote here, this is perfectly acceptable generic programming like code, nothing surprising about it. There's no possible way we could know what T was, right? Unless we had a trait called value type that we could reference in the context of something like this. So then, you know, I could I could print this string by basically saying, you know, print projects. So I could I could do that. And that's 
completely generic. I could I could make I could change my use of vector down in the main program to be a deck or a set. I guess I better put a constant iterator, otherwise it won't compile. Um, so I could change vector to something else, but that function never has to change, and that's because the types, the containers in STL, by convention, enforced by everything else in STL, require there to be a trait called const iterator or iterator or value type. And that allows us to write generic code that can work independently of what types these things are working on. Questions? OK. Priority queue is a little bit more interesting. So you can see here, we're going to define a class or struct called place. And it's got a distance and a destination. And it has a constructor that uh, takes a distance and a destination and stashes things away in those data members. And then it's got operator less than. Very important. It's got to have operator less than. If it doesn't have operator less than, you'll see what it'll do. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and, and run this code, because it's kind of interesting to illustrate what it's doing. All right. I was uh, I was in a meeting today with a guy who uh, he's a really interesting guy. He went to Stanford, has an engineering degree, now he teaches at the business school, and he was watching me do some email and an editor and stuff like that. And he's like, "What is that you're writing? Is that COBOL?" Because Emacs is just so obscure to most people. <laughs> All right, so hopefully this will compile. Hey, it does. Okay, so let's take a look at this program. What it's going to do is it's going to come through and uh, create a priority queue that's parameterized by place. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to push some items into the priority queue. So we push the names of cities and their distance from San Diego. Uh, and then we go ahead and while the queue is not empty, we pop the items out of the queue. Now you'll notice we just put them in in whatever order we felt like. But they're going to come out of the queue in priority order, where in this case priority means you know, highest value, which might not be what you expect, but we'll fix that in a second. So the thing that's the greatest distance is the highest priority. Now if you don't like that, if you don't think that's the way you want to do priority, that's really easy. Just come over here to this operator less than, and you just change it, and make it greater than. So now, things that are closer become higher priority, right? You control what high priority means in this particular case, because you define what operator less than means for this particular data type that we parameterize the priority queue with. Danny? Would it be more valid to implement an operator that you just change it like you did the operator less than to the operator greater than? Well, not, not necessarily the operator greater than from the sizes or the distances. Or would there be a better way to do that? <sighs> Uh, in this particular context, that's, that's probably the, the best way. Now, you can also play other tricks, and you can pass in different. Um, you could also pass in uh, a functor. By default, it uses less as the functor, but you could also pass in greater, and that would be another way you could do it. So that would require no changes to the class. You'd get the different behavior, but the, uh, the thing would stay the same. So, so let me just show you one interesting thing. If we were to remove operator less than, and try to compile it, we get you know, incomprehensible gobbledygook error messages. And if you search here long enough, you'll find something saying, no match for operator less than in underscore, underscore, x, less than underscore, underscore, y. But you really have to know how to pull out the error messages. This is the thing about STL. When, when all goes well, uh, it's great. When things go wrong, it's confusing because you get strange error messages. Newer compilers are getting better about this, by the way, but older compilers tend to give you somewhat incomprehensible stuff. Yeah? When you create the object. When, when we create, uh, let me get rid of this. Let me get rid of this line noise. So here, You can tell it to do something besides 
um, it, it defaults to less. If you go take a look, for example, let's go take a look at this. So here's priority queue. Here's the reference. So you can see, where is it? Um, priority queue is a template that's parameterized by type T, the container, which is vector, the comparison function, which defaults to less. So if you are so inclined and are willing to deal with lots of syntactic gobbledygook, you can pass in a different comparator function than less. You could make it be greater. And then it would use the greater operator that was defined as opposed to the less than operator that was defined. Yes, yes, it would. Yeah, yeah, because it would use greater. Can you remind what the dot 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 operator does again? <laughs> the dot 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 operator? Did you mention that doing dot 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 actually doesn't make this thing bigger? <clears throat> well, OK, so there's, there's two ways in which operator dot 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 gets used. That's a pretty funny question. Um, OK. Dot dot dot, C. Let's see, let's see if it even can figure out syntactically how to, how to get that one to explain. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of confusing it, isn't it? Let's see if we can figure it out. Uh, yeah, let's see. There we go. So basically, uh, the most common use of dot, 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 yeah, <laughs> is for catching exceptions that you don't know what they are. So you'll often have some you know, try catch block. And you have a bunch of exceptions you know how to handle. And then at the end, you know, something else happens, dot, dot, dot. So that would be a case of using dot, dot, dot. That's the most common case of dot, dot, dot. Um, I probably was, there's also places you can use it in the context of um, template parameters. So you can have variable argument parameters. This is also true in, in, uh, in Java, by the way. You can have functions that take a variable number of parameters. And so the dot, dot, dot there is used in much the same way to say, this, this is, this, I'm not going to tell you everything, but you're going to have to figure it out at, right, at runtime. It's got, they're called variadic parameter lists. C has them, C++ has them, Java has them, and they use dot, dot, dot as well. I was probably using dot, dot, dot in much the way that Elaine used yada, yada on Seinfeld. So I would just sort of, you know, and you're writing your program, and it doesn't compile, and you make some fixes, yada, 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 and then you get an A, right? So I'm sort of glossing over the, the interesting part. That's probably how I was using it. But it does actually have meanings. Yes? If we were to do, like you said, where you had to pass in, you were passing in the operator that you wanted to overwrite for a priority queue, uh -huh. would you also have to put in, in the, the angle brackets, what container you're using? Or would it? Cause You'd have to put all that gobbledygook in there, which is why I'm not doing it on the fly, because it's, it's tedious. But if you. Um, Go over here and take a look at priority queue. Uh, you can see that there, there are three parameters that are passed into priority queue. Right? There's type T, there's the container, and there's let the comparison functor. Two of them are defaulted, which means we don't have to give them. If you start to give the other ones, if you if you want to have the third one, you have to give the second one as well. So that's it's doable. It just it just requires some some fishing around and, and working through the syntax, but it's it's quite doable. OK, any questions about? So the, the lesson here is that when you try to compile something that, uh, oh yeah, it doesn't like dot, dot, dot <laughs> um, in that context. If you compile something and it doesn't quite know what to do, you often have to search for a while to try to find it out. Anybody here ever seen Fellowship of the Rings? So remember the scene where they're talking about how Gollum was tormented, tortured in Mordor. And after the many anguished screams, they got two things from him. What were the two things? Exactly. Very good. Very good. All right. <laughs> I'm reading my son, who's seven, uh, The Lord of the Rings. We finished The Hobbit. And I made the mistake last night of showing him a picture of the Balrog. And so like, he didn't sleep last night. He was all freaked out. It's so funny. <laughs> but. Uh, Actually, I think it might have been the Barrow Whites that did him in. You know, he was like, Dad, show me a Barrow White, which are actually more scary in many ways than the Balrog. But uh, anyway, anybody else bummed out that
Tom Bombadil didn't show up in the movie. Yeah, right? I'm really bummed out about that. If I if I had all the money in the world, I would hire Peter Jackson to film that sequence, right? That would be my my thing I would do with all the money in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's container adapters. The next topic is iterator adapters. So iterator adapters are things that can take stuff that's not an iterator and make it look like it's an iterator. So it's in a classic adapter. And it gets used a lot in the context of various algorithms like copy and, and the family of things that relate to copy, as well as remove and replace and so on. <clears throat> so, uh, you'll see that there's a wide variety of things that we can adapt. We can adapt containers. We can adapt I.O. stream. You can adapt I.O. streams for files, I.O. streams for standard in, standard out kinds of things, or CN and C error and, and uh, C out and so on. <clears throat> and uh, one of the great things about using the iterator adapters is it's possible for them to automatically grow the underlying container without you having to know the sizes of what you're working on in advance. So that's a really neat feature. And that's basically what the back inserter did. So we've seen the back inserter before. Uh, and uh, here's basically back inserter. So we, we looked at this example already, uh, with just a little bit more verbose than what we did before. We go ahead and create ourselves an iterator adapter that is going to adapt standard in, an iterator adapter that's going to keep track of the, the end of the stream. And then we copy from the beginning to the end. And every element from the input, where we, it could be arbitrarily long, right? It's, it's input after all. We don't know how big it is. Every one of those elements that gets read by copy is going to stick at the end of the vector using a pushback using back inserter. So remember, back inserter is going to call the pushback operation on whatever container you pass it. And so the great thing is we don't have to know the size in advance. Vector, as you see, vector up there is just vector v. We don't know whether it's big or small or what. But every time through, back inserter is going to add an element at the end of the vector by calling pushback. Qu uh, quick question for you. Why is back inserter a function? Or what benefit do we get by having back inserter be a function? Deduction. Type deduction. Very good. So type deduction means that because it's a function, it can figure out the type of this thing. And internally, it creates a back inserter uh, iterator object. But that object would not have been able to deduce the type because objects can't, or structs, or classes can't deduce types, but functions can. I do not begin to understand all the details of why they do that, but that's the rules. So we have all these adapter functions that are used for type deduction. Once again, the, the thing to remember there is less code to write yourself. Yes? Uh, so what this code will do under the hood is it'll use whatever IO streams provides in order to be able to read from the input stream and treat everything one after another as an int. So that and that's that's not adapter related. That's just the way that IO streams works. It's going to take whatever you give it and it's going to try, you know, as as best it can with its best effort to convert the input stream into ints. Now the input stream may not be intable. You know, it could just be the text to James Joyce's Ulysses or something like that and make no sense when viewed as ints. But that's not, that's not this guy's problem. You know, it's, the, it's the input stream's problem if you feed it the wrong information. OK, um, another set of adapters, and we'll kind of wrap this up and take the quiz here in just a minute, function adapters. So function adapters have a variety of purposes. Uh, one of the things that function adapters do is they are used to be able to provide function composition and binding. We'll see we have these things called binders and negators that we'll talk about. And they also allow you to be able to take things that are not um, C++ functions. Or they, they're not functors, sorry. They're not functor objects. And you can make them work in contexts where functors are expected. So you can use things like pointers to member functions or member functions. You can use things like pointers to functions. Other kinds of things can be used and adapt them to work nicely in the context of a function adapter. Let's take a look at a couple examples. Here's a, a binder example. Let's see if we can make this format so you can see all of it. It's close. <laughs> Let me shrink it by one. 
No, that's too small. Um, what, we're, what we're getting rid of here doesn't really hurt us. So what we're doing here is we are creating a vector of 10 items with a default value of 2. And then we're doing a partial sum. So we're going to add those things up from the beginning to 10. And then we're doing a random shuffle. What random shuffle does is it just takes the contents of a vector and it randomly rearranges them. So when you're all done, they're randomly rearranged. And it's, it's a clever algorithm the way it works. And then we go ahead and we print the output. And now we're going to go down and we're going to take account of all the elements that are in this randomly shuffled partial summed vector that have a value that's greater than the constant 10. <clears throat> Count if, if as is implied by the underscore if predicate. It's a predicate algorithm or suffix. It's, it's the if suffix is a dead giveaway. This is a predicate algorithm. And it's going to call this particular functor in order to check what it should count or not. And what it's counting is it's taking the greater than functor that we already have, that already exists, and it's using greater than, which is a binary functor, in a context that expects a unary functor. Count if expects a unary or, or unary predicate functor with one parameter, right? The thing that you have each element in the, in the vector. And so what we're doing is we're binding this functor to the constant 10. Hey, how's it going, Jerry? To the constant 10. And then the bind second adapter returns a functor that has operated, operation function call defined on it. And under the hood, it stashes away the greater than functor and the const. And every time its operator function call is called with one parameter, it takes that one parameter and it calls the multiply functor it stashed away with that parameter and the constant 10. So that way, we don't have to write a special purpose functor called greater than 10, which would be a you know, very, very special purpose and, and not very, very helpful. Here's uh, some other stuff. I'm not going to rush through this because they're worth understanding these things. Let me just take a quick sanity check and see how we're doing here. We are on slide 59 out of 80. And um, here are a few more things. Oh, yeah, this is my favorite all-time example. We won't dwell on this for long now. But anybody here ever see the, the TV show Kung Fu? It's probably a little Oh, I watched it when I was in junior high school, so you can tell how long it is <laughs> ago. If you ever watched the movie Office Space, there's a little riff on Kung Fu. Anyway, in Kung Fu, there's the, the, you know, the master, and there's the pupil. And the pupil says, you know, when you can snatch the the pebble from my hand, grasshopper, that's what he called his disciple, it will be time for you to go. So when you can take a look at this code here, and you can truly and deeply understand what it is doing and why, you will have achieved some kind of enlightenment or mastery, right? And then you can, again, if you ever watch Kung Fu, at the very end, he has to pick up this pot full of boiling liquid and basically give himself you know, sort of permanent brands on his wrists or something like that. So you can do that too. <laughs> but the, this, is the, this is the function. So if you want a little bit of fun, read ahead and take a look at that and puzzle it out. It's pretty cool. It demonstrates the use of about you know, three key STL concepts, all of which come together in one line of code. So it's very, very elegant. OK. With that, let us assume quiz position. <laughs> <laughs>